last three years, he has attended the State University of West Georgia and is currently a second lieutenant in the Air Force ROTC program at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, where he'll be transferring this fall. He is a pre-medical -med student, uh, also majoring in mechanical engineering, and also plans to minor in biomedical engineering uh, while at Georgia Tech. Over the last two years, Drew has worked as a patient advocate in the emergency room of Tanner Medical Center in Carrollton, Georgia which has allowed him an inside look at the reality of a career as a physician. She has also maintained an active interest in space medicine and space research. He was president and founder of the University of West Georgia uh, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space Society in 1998, and a participant in the NASA Space Life Sciences Training Program at Kennedy Space Center in 1999. He was also a participant uh, this year in NASA's Reduced Gravity Student Flight Opportunities Program at JSC and also conducts monthly space-related informational sessions to local schools and community groups. Drew is also a volunteer at the Atlanta VA Medical Center and a member of various clubs and organizations including Phi Kappa Phi, the American Medical Students Association, and the Arnold Air Society. His career plans include intending an MD-PhD program following graduation, working as a flight surgeon with the Air Force, and then ultimately becoming an astronaut. Please join me in welcoming Drew Pounds. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank Eleanor for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I kind of agree with uh, one of our earlier speakers that it's quite an honor to be speaking at the same conference as Bud Hall, so that's um, kind, of, kind of nice. I basically found out about the 13th Humans in Space Symposium uh, last summer when I was at the Kennedy Space Center for the Space Life Sciences Training Program. We were all in the process of getting our papers ready for presentation at the end of the program and I uh, received something in the mail about the 13th Humans in Space Symposium and I looked at it and it said Greece, you know, and I was like, well, that'd be cool, go to Greece. And so I took the application or the uh, abstract basically that I had written up for my presentation at the Space Life Sciences Training Program and sent it to Greece and didn't really hear a whole lot back from them for a while. Um, around, I guess, August, we started, uh, started getting emails from them and, uh, saying that they needed me to send another abstract, they needed me to be a little bit more detailed about what the presentation was going to be about and this kind of thing and what my project was really like. And so I did all those things. And in the process, our uh, project was going real well. We were accepted to the NASA Reduced Gravity Student Flight Opportunities Program down in Houston, Texas. And we got our group together to do that program, and we went to Houston, and we were getting ready for our flight on the Vomit Comet, when one night I got received an email that said we had been accepted to this symposium. And so naturally, my teammates and I were all just ecstatic. You know, we're going to Greece, we're going to Greece. Well, when we got home, we realized that it was going to take a lot of money to go to Greece. So before I start all this, I want to really thank the State University of West Georgia for giving us the uh, monetary means to travel to Greece, because it was uh, certainly a great experience, and I hope I can relay that to you all today. Um, basically, the session consisted of uh, 26 technical sessions, uh, four, four plenary le lectures, uh, four special evening events, and there are various tours made available to the uh, people who are going to be attending the conference. And uh, there were a great number of astronauts, uh, cosmonauts, engineers, scientists from all over the world at this conference. Uh, it was sponsored by the International Academy of Astronautics and the uh, Greek Aerospace uh, Medicine Association. Uh, so there were really a lot of uh, interesting people at this, this uh, conference. And uh, so I hope I can just give you a little bit of insight on what the symposium was like and maybe encourage you all to attend the symposium the next time it happens. Uh, it's the 13th Humans in Space Symposium, but it's not the 13th Annual Humans in Space Symposium. They basically have these about every three or four years when there's enough sort of worldwide knowledge about space medicine that would warrant having a symposium like this. And so uh, some of the technical sessions that were um, available for us to attend were cardiovascular function, uh, future challenges, uh, there was uh, some studies or some talks about analogous environments. A lot of talk about the uh, MIR program. Uh, there were set many, many Russian uh, people there who were involved with their space program. And um, so there was a lot of talk about the MIR. A lot of talk about SpaceHab uh, and looking at what we did on SpaceHab, what we did on the MIR, and how that can reflect towards 
the International Space Station later on. There was also, on the page just before that, you saw some neuro things. There was a lot of studies and talks about neurology. Um, there was a lot of talk about educating the people. And one of the talks actually was uh, the experiment's not through until the people know, or something along those lines. And basically it was just hitting at the, the fundamental need for us to take our research that we're doing and all of our interest in space and go out and tell everyone about it, you know. And so that was a, something that I really keyed in on, talking to kids and talking to students and, and traveling around doing these kind of presentations. Uh, there's also biology, microgravity uh, studies, uh, a lot of talk about artificial gravity and a lot of uh, experiments and presentations about uh, people and their experiments on their various means of uh, artificial gravity via here in the United States, the KC-135, in France, they have another reduced gravity simulator, and I believe there's another one in Japan and also Russia. There are also talks about radiation, uh, human performance factors, uh, life support, um, operational medicine, which would have been very fun to attend. However, the techn technology session, which I was presenting in, uh, was at the same time as the operational medicine presentations, and so I could attend those. So one of my teammates went and rubbed it in my face afterwards how good they were, what all I missed. So. Um, what I want to do now is just go over about three or four of the sessions that I thought were particularly informative and just give you a brief overview of, of, those, pres of those presentations. I have a book here, it's the uh, guide basically to the symposium, and it has listed all of the abstracts for all of the presentations that were made. And I'll be here until tomorrow afternoon around 12. My poster for my own project is in the room uh, joining us here, and uh, if you want to come by and get and make a copy of that abstract. There's email addresses and things like that in there, and you're all welcome to do that. So the first presentation that I, I went to, actually, on Monday, it was bright and early at 8.30 in the morning after get, trying to get over jet lag, was the non-invasive examination of cardiovascular systems during parabolic flights. And it was presented by Dr. Oleg Atkoff. And uh, Dr. Atkoff uh, is currently an inactive cosmonaut, but he was a cosmonaut who was also a physician, is now a civilian physician uh, with the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Russia. Uh, he flew on the Soyuz T-10 in February of 1984 for a record number of 237 days in space. So he was really spaced out. Um, his experiment or his presentation and his project consisted of 22 volunteers. Uh, they used plasmography measurements, uh, 2D echo studies, and uh, Frank Lee vectocardiograms, uh, all to study how the cardiovascular system reacted during parabolic flight. And uh, the plasmography um, examinations were done using two paravane apparatuses, which basically were gauges made of elastic tubing filled with mercury. And their 2D echo studies were used, done using the Aspen Accusan machine. Uh, and the work was done at the Cardiovascular Research Complex in Moscow. And it showed that the blood volume shift from uh, both legs between uh, the phases of uh, parabolic flight, which basically entail going from a normal 1G flight to a 0G flight to a 2G flight and back and forth. Uh, during those, those shifts, the uh, volume shift from both legs were, was around 500 milliliters. And after about 12 to 15 seconds, uh, the degree of the VCG studies changed, decreased, and so they considered that a concentratory reaction. Uh, the conclusions were the transition from hypergravity to microgravity has basically two phases. One is an acute phase of fluid shifts, the other is an acute phase of adaptation. And uh, so it was a, a very a very informative talk. Uh, he was a very uh, approachable uh, guy, and after the thing was over, we talked, and I told him that I'd been on the microgravity simulator here in the States, and uh, I was proud of the fact that he had got sick when he flew, and I didn't, so. Uh, the next, one of the next talks I went to on the following day was uh, by Canadian astronaut Robert Thirst, and it was from the Mir Space Hab to ISS, and uh, one thing I've heard at this conference is a lot of people who are, who are doing research of their own, or who are interested in doing research, are also interested in seeing their projects flown on board the Space Shuttle or the International Space Station, and I've even talked to one gentleman who has had some, this project flown on the show. And so I thought this was extremely, um, I guess, would extremely, I guess, apply to this audience. Uh, basically, uh, Mr. Thirst was wanting to try and tell the people who he was talking to how to design a project for the show. 
uh, some of the things, some of the, the ways and uh, mistakes that have been made and, and things we can learn from those mistakes to better prepare our projects for the space station and uh, for future shuttle missions. Uh, he actually had one flight on board STS-78, but this project was done in conjecture with that shuttle flight and also Neurolab uh, and STS-90. Uh, David Williams and Richard Linehan are also astronauts who assisted him in this study in this paper. Uh, the title, as you can see, was Crew Training and Operations of Physiology Payloads for the Space Lab Missions. And uh, the lesson learned were regarding crew training and operations of uh, physiological payloads. Uh, the big thing he really stressed was just attention to detail, which seems, you know, kind of uh, trivial, but uh, you have all sorts of hardware that goes along with, with an experiment, usually. Uh, you have procedures and you have timelines that are supposed to be met on the shuttle flight. And these things have dates that they're supposed to be in for the crew. In other words, if you're a researcher and you have a project that's going on the shuttle, they want you to have all of your hardware procedures by X number of days. Well, life science experiments are just famous for you know extending past the deadlines. Oh, well, we don't have them ready yet, but we'll get them to you pretty soon. Well, he really stressed how important this was that you not do that because it uh, affects the crew training and it also affects their preparedness for the shuttle flight. Uh, he also talked about equipment stowage, which is one thing that I would never really thought to mention, but of course in microgravity everything floats. On the shuttle everything floats as well, unless it's taped down or velcroed down somehow. And he showed several slides of People trying, astronauts trying to do presentations with wires floating around all over the place and them getting all hemmed up in the wires and getting uh, boxes and things. Even big, huge apparatuses that were the main parts of the experiments that they didn't expect would float in microgravity would float up off the ground. They'd have to do, go to great lengths to uh, account for this problem. So those were some of the things he was talking about needed to be avoided if you were planning on sending your project up and aboard the shuttle. He also talked about human-machine interfaces and talked about how important if you have a control panel that you have to operate during your project, you know how important it is for that to be at around eye level or somewhere where it's easily accessible for the astronaut to operate. And he also talked about how important it was that the crew and the investigators and the mission support team all work together. And that was a, another big thing that he really stressed, that if you didn't have all three of those working together in cohorts for this experiment, then many times it was not going to work properly. And again, he emphasized the fact that the lessons learned from Space Hab and from uh, the Neurolab missions uh, could really be used to help uh, future projects on board the International Space Station. One topic that's been touched on here is the psychological factor, and the interaction of crews and, and their morale and those kind of things. And this was especially addressed in this presentation, the human interactions in space results from shuttle mirror. Uh, by Dr. Kansas from the University of Canals, I'm sorry, from the University of California, and also in conjunction with uh, several doctors from the Biomedical Problems Institute in Russia. Basically, it dealt with interpersonal, interpersonal issues that could affect crew members and mission support teams uh, during long duration multi multinational space missions. Uh, it was a 54, or it was a questionnaire consisting of 20, 54 astronauts and cosmonauts, and then there was a ground study also done to assist this on uh, three people in the mirror simulator for 135 days. Uh, again, it was a four and a half year NASA funded study and basically it focused on tension, cohesion, leader support, and displacement issues. In other words, basically placing the blame on others uh, with the shuttle and mirror crew and ground personnel. They used this, the questionnaire was designed around three psychological studies, the profile of mood states, the group environment scale, and the work environment scale. And uh, there were five astronauts, eight cosmonauts, 42 American, 16 Russian uh, ground personnel. The results were there was a significant increase in crew tension and an increase in crew leader support, mission control, and displacement after or in, during the second half of the mission. But one thing that was especially disappointing to me, being American, was that the Americans actually scored higher on work pressure. In other words, they felt like they were under much more pressure than did the cosmonauts. Uh, they also scored lower on task orientation, guidance from management, and support of their uh, astronaut crew leaders. And which, again, just showed that essentially the Russians were more focused on what they were doing. They felt like they were getting more guidance from their management, and they were more behind their crew members who had been placed in leadership roles. Uh, the ground personnel, they found that they were more negative than the crew, which just told me that 
people would enjoy being in space working more than on the ground. I can understand that. For the technology session, uh, I thought this was an especially interesting talk since I gave it. Um, it was filtering water sources for use in intravenous devices aboard the space shuttle and the International Space Station. It actually got the project, uh, being NASA of course, as uh, we mentioned earlier, it has to be an acronym. We called it FLUIDS and it stands for Filtering Liquids for Use in Intravenous Devices in Space. And I got this project started uh, on my experience at the Space Life Sciences Training Program. And the project actually got started a summer earlier by Dr. Kevin Fong and Dr. Clint Slaughter when they were working under the medical operations of NASA, Division of NASA. And so I came on board myself and uh, Argentria Twyman from Hallelujah College in Alabama. Came on board to this project uh, last summer, worked on it for about five weeks, uh, basically determined, or basically we were looking for a potential cost-effective solution to the problem of inadequate amounts of IV fluids on board the shuttle and the space station. As Ms. Blush mentioned earlier, there's very few, very little amounts of IV fluids on board the shuttle currently and in their medical kit. And actually, that very few is two. Two liters of IV fluids for up to seven astronauts. So that's just not quite enough. And uh, we were using a reverse osmosis filtration process to purify that water. We tested for bacterial colony content, uh, endotoxin levels, uh, chloride conductivity content, and pH levels. And we basically established the, the feasibility of sending up a similar system, though on a reduced scale, up on board the shuttle and on board the National Space Station. And then, during spring break of this year, we took the system down and tested it in parabolic flight on board the NASA KC-135. And the bottom right-hand corner up is our team logo, our reduced gravity team logo from the State University of West Georgia, and that's UW Micro G. I thought of that. I thought it was really funny. No one else ever seems to. Um, now I want to talk just a, real quickly about the plenary sessions they had at the conference uh, at the symposium. The first was communicating space to the public, uh, which I addressed just a little bit earlier, uh, by Peggy Wilhide, Associate Administrator of Public Affairs at NASA Headquarters. Uh, the second day was, to me, I was just a hog in heaven. I mean, I, the All About Flight plenary session had Joe Allen, Jeffrey Hoffman, Chike Mukai, which I know I just butchered that pronunciation, but uh, Valerie Polikoff, and I probably did the same there, Robert Thirsch, Bernard Harris, and Joan Bernicos was the chair of this uh, lecture. And it was about an hour session of you know, six astronauts just sitting up there talking and answering questions, sharing their experiences in space, talking about where they think, you know, where they envision that's coming from and where they envision that's going. And it was just, uh, just a real great session. Uh, in particular, I guess, uh, Dr. Polikov was, uh, had it as, he said he, he admitted that he had not really practiced his English in a while. So he would sit there kind of occasionally looking off into space, not really following the conversation as it was going on, but they asked um, the question to the panel if, if they were ever scared while they were in space. And the various astronauts were asking, you know, Mr. Polikoff was kind of just looking, twiddling his thumbs a little bit. And, uh, Robert Thurst, sitting beside him on his left, reached over and tapped him on the shoulder. You, you could tell that he was trying to explain to him the question that had been asked. And he, Suddenly looked at me, picked up the microphone, he opened up, he said, Of course, I'm normal, I was scared. So, it was real fun. Everybody got a big laugh out of it. I also got the pleasure to uh, sit and talk a long time to uh, Mr. Joe Allen, you see down on the far right. And uh, he was an extremely likable fellow, really uh, just down to earth and uh, just had a, a lot to say, a lot of advice to give. And uh, he took me over and introduced me to his wife and his friend of theirs who were with them at the, uh, the welcoming reception. He told me he wanted me to introduce myself as Drew Pounds from Greece. I was like, okay, sure, I'll do that. And I went over and I said, told his wife, hello, my name was Drew Pounds, I was from Greece. And she laughed and said, no, that's not a Greece accent. <laughs> but he was a, it was a very, very enjoyable session. The following day, they did the Exploration Challenge Body and Soul, kind of touched a little bit on the whole uh, soul versus spirit question. and. Almost went off into a religious talk, which they avoided, thankfully. And uh, the, thought, the last day was The Female Brain by Dr. Kathy Olson, who, uh, who's a NASA chief scientist. And uh, of course, we know that's totally, there's no way we'll ever understand that. So. <laughs> just playing. It's just a joke. The evening activities, they had an activity pretty much every night. The uh, first night was a welcoming reception. Uh, they had an evening with Patrick Moore, who's Big astronomy buff. He's been doing the Scott Night radio program since 1954. Has over 60 books on astronomy. The 
third night, they did a wine night at the Otonio Winery, which again, I probably butchered the pronunciation. And they had Greek food and wine uh, tasting there. And then they had a big gala banquet, and Jeff Hoffman actually showed up in his astronaut suit, so that was really exciting. Uh, they also had various tours that they made available at reduced rates to people who were attending the conference. I went to the Acropolis, uh, the Oracle of Delphi, while we were in Athens, waiting to fly to Santorini. And uh, just standing at the Acropolis was just, just amazing. I mean, just think, trying to envision what it might have looked like, and the people who had walked where I was walking, and just was really overwhelming. Uh, then at, on the island of Santorini, they had a tour of the caldera, which is the center of the island, essentially. It's uh, where the volcano melted up and came up above the water, of course. And in the red beach of Santorini, is down at the southern tip of the island. They have uh, a, essentially, it's just a red beach. It's where there's a, a, a rock, a huge mountainous formation at the bottom of the island is, is made of iron. And it's uh, corroded, eroded over the years and has essentially painted the beach red. It was, I guess, the closest thing I've been to yet to Mars, which it was great to stand and look at the red rocks and, and the red sand and think, you know, yes, I'm on Mars. And then you hear the waves crash behind you, which really threw the whole little picture off. So. Um, I really appreciate you letting me talk with you today. Uh, I had a, a blast at the symposium. I can't wait to find out where it's going to be next time. Hopefully it's not the Arctic or the South Pole, but if it's, um, no matter where it is, I plan on attending. It's certainly worth uh, the time and, and the effort, and I hope West Georgia thinks it was worth the money. Um, but once again, I'd like to thank Eleanor for having me talk. Uh, I'd like to also invite you tomorrow morning. I'll be uh, defending my poster, they're calling it. I hope I don't have to defend it too much off the bar uh, tomorrow morning from uh, 8.30 to 10.30. And uh, I have one, one, one last thing. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. David Salvi, who is here with his NASA shirt on. I think that's what he's got on. He's a great friend of mine. We met at SLSTP. And uh, I, at that program, uh, it's, you just can't help but make lifelong friends. And David's come here today with, I think his parents are here with him also uh, for some moral support. I need a lot of that. And uh, so, once again, thank you very much. I know the time is late, but any questions for Drew at all before we break for lunch? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, who runs this conference? Who runs the conference? It was put on by uh, the Greek uh, Aeronautical or the Greek Aeromedical Association and the International Academy of Astronautics. The conference was uh, the conference was primarily in English. It was uh, English was official language of the conference. And uh, so the, all the talks were given in English. And uh, of course, some of the French speakers especially, they, they called that English, but I, I could swear that wasn't what they were speaking. Uh, any other questions? I, I love questions. I thought we were out of time. Yes, sir? Yeah, is, are the abstracts available on the web, a survey of the conference itself? Yes, sir, they certainly are. Um, the web page or the web address is in the book. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't make that up on the slide, but I'll get you that if you'd like to see. Uh, also, you can just go to you know Yahoo or something and look up 13 Humans. They have a great web page. Uh, it's got a little biography of all the astronauts that were there and you know, all the cosmonauts who were in attendance. And uh, so it's, it's a really good web page. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. One more question. You mentioned on the intravenous fluids that they take two liters right now on the Two liter, two, two bags of space. You said that wasn't enough. Is that your opinion or NASA agree to that? Well, that's obviously my opinion. That NASA hasn't, uh, I don't think NASA would agree to that. But uh, I know a very, very, very fine lady over there about the fourth row who would definitely agree with me. So. Um, if, if you look at, I mean, if you look at, as she mentioned earlier, if you if you have a minor surgery that needs to, be, that needs to take place on board the shuttle, well, there's your two bag shot. So you've got seven astronauts, two bags. The, the math just doesn't really quite work out. Of course, there's not been, to my knowledge, a situation where they had to use the two liters that they have on board. But if there ever were that, that situation, our filtration system would uh, provide a way of, and of hydrating, basically, anhydrous IV bags on board the shuttle, using on board shuttle water sources, uh, like gray water, black water, and uh, producing a, a liquid that, or water that could be injected directly into the veins. So that is, the, I guess, the purpose of our project. Is it, uh, is, it, is it possible that this could just be a standard for injection? Well, the U.S. Pharmacopeia has standards for water for injection, 
and the, currently the filtration system on board the shuttle does not filter the water to the point where it would meet those standards. Right. What's on board now, Colonel? That's certainly a possibility, yes. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, and this concludes uh, the Space Life Sciences session. Thanks.